thanks so much for having me. I'm quite excited to be here. It's my first conference after this whole thing happened in person, so it's quite excited, exciting to see that many people here. So, and be with you, with people, with humans. It's weird, isn't it? Did web development lose the right direction or did we lose the right direction? So I am a JavaScript hipster death, right? So and this is a talk about general best practices. Who's writing JavaScript every day these days? So I've given this probably half of the people, I think. Um, so this is a talk about general best practices. I've given it a few times and some people told me, well, Siobhan, maybe, maybe it's more like a rant about general best practices. But who am I to rant about the web and what all these hipster JavaScript developers are doing? So let me quickly introduce myself. Hey, I'm Stefan. I'm from Berlin, Germany. So I flew in yesterday. I had to get up at four because I made the mistake to get a flight at seven. Never ever do that. It's puzzling you for days. I do JavaScript and web development for 10 years now. And I work for this company that is called Contentful. So if you have the need for a content management system or a content management platform in the cloud for your hipster JavaScript apps or other apps, and you just want to use an API to deliver and edit content, you can give content for a try. So and as I mentioned, I'm doing web development now for a decade. So let me tell you how it started for me. And this is probably a few of you had the same journey. So I was studying computer science and now I'm the proud owner of a bachelor's degree. If that was useful or not is a different story. But I also did an internship in eventually and I started doing and started working in an e-commerce business. And even though I was in my fifth or sixth semester of studying computer science, I had no clue about this. This is what the industry and what the people in Berlin were doing. And in the front end, what we had is we had prototype and jQuery for the people that do front end development for long enough. These two things basically do the same thing, but we had them both because more is always better, right? Then the entire thing was built on a Magento PHP platform because we were selling things. And then slowly but surely, more interactivity moved into the client. So Backbone Jazz happened. <laughs> that were wild times. Complete unstructured mess. I mean, I wrote, I wrote a lot of spaghetti in that times. So in the same time, common front and best practices started to appear. So what you see here is why slow, which was one of these first collections of, hey, you should build for the web like that. Because otherwise it's, becoming terribly slow. And then I was completely hooked by all this stuff going on in the front end in the development world. And I got this dream of becoming a favorite blogger. So you see my first blog was me and my colleagues wanted to become famous. We made it up to 10 posts and was uh, built with Jekyll. I had no clue what I was doing. So everything was based on Markdown. But then front end slowly but surely kind of started to pick up with speed. Has anyone used these two, Grunt and Gulp? So these were kind of the first things where it started, front-end developers started putting things into a pipeline. So it was going minification, concatenation, and we were doing more and more and more, and then Angular appeared, Angular 1, so I did that for a while. Then React appeared and Vue appeared, and it was just like bam, 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 bam. Only in a few years, all these kind of things happened. And let me just tell you that I really love this technology and I love writing JavaScript. So I, I abandoned my first blog, right? Because my, my friends were not blogging that much. So I went solo. And what you see here is my, my own blog, um, the way that it looked like from 2017 till 2020. And you see there, well, it's a normal blog, not much going on there. But you see that there are some fancy transitions going on from left to right. And I don't want to tell you how much time I spent on this. It was using one of these cutting edge new JavaScript frameworks. And that's completely fine for your personal blog, right? Completely fine. And I tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it. And you may know Lighthouse, which comes in, my clicker is delaying. So you may know Lighthouse, which comes in Google Chrome, which is basically a monitoring tool to kind of give you a quality score. And you see there that I had an overall green score, which is already a success. And 
Then I uh, went to a different service, which is called webpagetest.org. So if you want to test your sites with real devices around the world, so you go to web page tests, you see there that I had a speed index on a cable connection of roughly a second. This means that on a cable connection, the majority of the website was rendered after a second. That's it. That's good, right? And even on a mobile connection with 3G, it was rendering in four and a half seconds. And I spent a lot of time on that, and honestly, I was proud. I was really proud because I did a good job. Usually, when you get a 90 Lighthouse performance score, you're in the top five performing websites on this planet. So if you get a 90 there, be proud of yourself. You're doing a good job. So I was spending a lot of time with HTTP2, which is now the de facto standard. Everything was compressed and minified. I had module bridges in there before ECMAScript modules were cross browser supported. I had proper font handling in there. I was preloading a lot of things. And of course, it started with Grunt and Gulp. I was doing this stuff, right? Splitting the bundle into things that are loaded at certain moments in time to kind of save downloads when people are visiting my tiny blog. So I felt very, very confident about that. And then two years ago, this site was trending on Hacker News. So while this site might not look very modern to you, do you see something? It is snappy and it is incredibly fast. And I checked it this morning. This person maintaining this site is, so the screenshot is now older, but the person just published a new thing like two months ago. So this site is still maintained, which amazes me kind of. But I tell you something, this person is not spending weekends on maintaining that. And when you look under the hood, you will see, well, there's all the good stuff, right? We have a GIF with the email rotating thingy, which I wanted to put on my website, but I didn't do yet. It's table layouts. It's all these kind of things that you actually don't do today anymore. So I was outraged. I went back to Lighthouse. What happened? I ran a test, full 100 score. How could that be? And even my blog that I set up with Jekyll years ago, not knowing much about web development, was outperforming my highly crafted universal JavaScript app. Quite depressing, to be honest. So I couldn't believe it, and I went to webpagetest.org slash video. So in case you don't know it, you can go there, you can put in three URLs, and you get a video like that. Well, I was indeed outperformed by a random person in Italy, not knowing much about web development. So you could now say, well, Stefan, you just messed it up. And honestly? That could be, yeah. I mean, we all mes make mistakes. But let me ask you one question. How can it be so easy to mess up? So when we look under the hood of these websites, what we see is that, first of all, the page rate of my site is way, way higher for a content site, right? It's w way much stuff that I ship. My index site or my index HTML file is huge. CSS resources don't really matter in that context. But look at these JavaScript resources. I was shipping 22 JavaScript files for a blog. Is that the right approach? I'm not sure. Images don't, <laughs> don't really matter because the first site was also shipping. No, different files. So really, um, this is what the framework did, right? It's chunking all these kind of thing in, in certain files. A lot of things are lazy loaded. Um, but it's still a lot of things that you ship down. Image resources don't really matter in that context, but all the combination of these kind of points lead to the speed index, right? And speed index is, the com is, uh, is a number that tells you how quickly is things, are things rendered. And then ideally, or later on to this uh, lower Lighthouse performance score, which you want to keep on your radar, right? Because Google search looks at these kind of numbers. So how is this Lighthouse performance score calculated? So you see here that it's a mix of various metrics. So it's 10% uh, of first contentful paint. It is 10% of time to interactive. It's 10% uh, speed index. Then there is largest contentful paint, uh, paint, total blocking time, and cumulative layout shift. 
So you can look these up, whatever these means. Um, basically, it's some quality metrics on how fast this website feels. But 40% rely on JavaScript, on the JavaScript that we sent down, that has to be downloaded, executed, parsed, to do one thing or another. If you want to learn more about Lighthouse and performance numbers, um, uh, Carolina von Calibre, who, which is a uh, web performance monitoring system, wrote a nice blog post, so you can check that one out. And also Paul Irish maintains this Lighthouse performance calculator. So if you have an 89 right now, and you wonder what it takes to be a 91, to be in the top five, you can check that one out. But why is that so important? Why is JavaScript considered by Google so important? And the reason for that is, is this. Even if we pre-render things, people don't understand that we ship a UI that is not functional yet. It's, people don't get that. When I look at my mom, and she's pressing this button like 10 times because JavaScript has to be downloaded, parsed, executed. She doesn't get it. And people are frustrated by that. And not everybody is running on the latest iPhone, on a fast connection. These things add up. Tim Kandlek, um, who is a web performance consulting, did, consult, consultant, did a little bit of research and looked a little bit how long phones need to uh, spend time on the CPU with JavaScript. And you see here that on a median, React sites need 10 seconds CPU time to deal with the stuff that a website is shipping down. And on the, on the higher end, it is actually going up to 15 seconds. How many times do you wait 15 seconds right clicking on this button? I don't. Our friends at Netflix did a little bit of play around. Um, they had this sign-up form. And what is a sign-up form, right? It is two fields, maybe three or four, name, email, password, this kind of thing. And they ship with React. Full-fledged framework, right? Do you need that for a little bit of validation and making an XJX request? Probably not. And they went with a little bit of vanilla JavaScript and they moved or improved the time to interactive by 50%. You cannot have a more valuable spot for your conversion than this one, right? This is immediately conversion, media conversion for your product or whatever you're selling. So what you have to keep in mind is that 150 kilobytes of an image is Nothing, really nothing compared to 150 kilobyte of gzipped JavaScript. Page weight is not equal page weight. So when I showed you or I shared with you my index HTML site, 340k in an index HTML file, right? I hang out on Twitter quite a lot, so I shared my numbers and the person was like, what are you doing, Stefan? Aren't you like a performance person? What the hell is in your site? So basically, I was getting into this argument and was saying, well, I'm doing code splitting and doing all the things that front-end developers do these days. It is following all best practices. And I may or may not have won this argument at the time. But basically, what I was doing in this situation is I was telling it's great because it's fast, which is not necessarily true but it is still lighter than the rest of the internet. And the question is, should that be the baseline better than the rest? So what I actually was doing there was, well, my friend, I'm really digging this tech stack and I want to play with technology. And there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe the argument there was a little bit wrong. So what was in my site, in this index HTML file? So what was in there was something like that. So when you ship universal JavaScript frameworks, for example, that run code on the server and on the client, you have to tell the client side JavaScript the data that was used to render all this HTML. Usually it is inlined in one way or another in your index HTML file. And past me decided that it was a smart idea to inline and preload 22 in, uh, articles with an average session length of 1.17 pages. And for the worst, I did that for better performance. So you could now say that making a very fast website is extremely hard. But I want to question that a little bit. Because is it really? So for, uh, my friend Phil Hawksworth from Netlify 
Um, he shared once, well, to ship a very fast website, just keep it simple. And don't add things that make it slow. And for the Jamstack sites and for the sites that are come with a pure approach, the work usually was done before a visitor actually came, uh, got there. So I couldn't believe that, right? I was spending hours code splitting, improving things. So I set up another site project. So what you see here is tiny-helpers.dev. So in my spare time, I like to make lists of things. So if you uh, um, are looking for all these tools that you will never find on Google, like to transform code or to download Google fonts, they're pretty much on this site. And I built it with a fairly new static site generator that is called 11T. It comes very pure. It's not adding any things to your site that you don't need. And you see there, without doing anything, I had a 100 performance score. Exactly, the maintainer of 11T um, puts this into their doc documentation. And due to this pure approach that this generator follows, the sites built with 11T have a median Lighthouse score of a solid 100. That is something to be proud of, honestly. So this is not framework or 11T specific. It's just pure websites that are not adding things that are slowing the user down. So a few years ago, I was speaking at NDC Oslo. So this is me on stage, and I said, every website is a web app, and every web app is a website. And oh boy. Well, people learn on the way, right? So today, I 100% disagree with past me. Because where's the benefit or the user benefit of all this stuff that we are shipping down to the user? So I briefly touched it already. So let's talk about the first best practice. Universal JavaScript apps for content sites. So when I started doing web development, what I did is um, HTML5 boilerplate was a thing. It had a Java-based build system and in place to crunch all these kind of things was magic. At the time, it was magic. So this is where we started. And we usually had two bundles, something like for, the, for your code and then something crunched for vendor code that is usually not changing very often. So with the universal JavaScript apps, this entire thing changed to inlighting this data that is used to render the site, as I mentioned, but also to render and load different components, code split, lazy loaded, all these kind of things. And the beauty of this approach is that the same code runs on the server and on the client. And by itself, I think this is beautiful. And I think that's fascinating. I mean, think about that. Your JavaScript code or your framework code runs in two environments. Beautiful. But in the same moment, that means that your code runs in both environments. On the server side, it really doesn't matter. You can control that environment, ship it down. And it's also not a bad thing when maybe your template structures are not that great and you have a lot of repetition in there because the result is just HTML. If you go to the client side, though, everything has to be downloaded, executed, and be parsed. This is a lot of complexity that you're dealing with. And now, now everything that you do is slowing down the user because you're shipping more and more and more and more. And is that really the best way for the user? I'm honestly not really sure about that anymore. What I hear every now and then is that this architecture offers doors for progressive enhancement. So if you're not familiar with progressive enhancement, the idea is ship a baseline functionality. And people always talk about stairs, so let's stick with stairs. And then you improve it. So stairs become escalators. This is the idea. Usually, this is done with a little bit of JavaScript. And if the enhancement still fails, everything should or is supposed to still happen. So pre-COVID, I was traveling a little bit. And how often do you see these things, actually, in the world? So this entire thing is maybe a broken example or a broken concept. But let me show you how you can build with progressive enhancement in mind. So what you see here is a project that I built um, a few years ago. You can interact with the search bar. You see that it is updating the search results. It is updating the URL. And you can refresh the entire thing. All these kind of interactions are JavaScript driven. But when JavaScript fails, or you deploy an error, or something is going wrong, and you hit the enter on the search results, 
still renders on the server side. The URL is still updated and everything is submitted. So whatever happens with the JavaScript, this will still work. Because depending on your project scales, your JavaScript will just fail. Because we have this big question mark in the middle, which is the network. Could be that a person's on the train. Maybe you messed it up, you deployed some faulty code, maybe. So eventually there will be an error with your JavaScript. And we really have to remember that we don't have any non-JavaScript users because sometimes there's this, this discussion going on in the communities. Nobody turns JavaScript off, right, Stefan? Everybody has JavaScript turned off while you and I are downloading, executing, and parsing JavaScript. So we're all non-JavaScript users all the time. A good example here is GitHub and what they're doing here. So they're enriching things with client-side JavaScript, but they have a form there with a button. If you hit the button, JavaScript is not there. That still works. Just reloads, gives you the new stuff. And also the things on top are five old school links. Just works. They can enhance that if they want to. Um, but I'm very happy with GitHub's experience because I honestly believe that a good site should just work. So what is the enhancement that people use this architecture for these days? So and I'm picking a little bit on React here. It is, I'm, um, I'm guilty of that myself, so don't pick that on React too much. But let's go to react.js.org. And there's a redesign and rebuild coming for React. So that is, will probably not be valid anymore in a few weeks. So we see here react.js.org, the docs for React. And we load that with a fast 3G connection. And you can click around. And it feels fairly snappy. I think it feels good. So let's do the same thing without JavaScript. So you load the entire thing. You click around. I would argue it is pretty much the same experience. But where's the difference here? The difference is with JavaScript, this is, if you uncompress it, one megabyte of JavaScript for a little bit of documentation and routing. Whereas when you go HTML only, you're with 175, which boils down to 50K in total. And even after a few navigations, right? Client-side navigation, beautiful. You can transition all these kind of things. And even after a few navigations, the JavaScript implementation, not offering much more than the plain implementation, is just a way heavier experience. And this is not a problem with the React team or with the industry or... I'm guilty of that too. This is exactly what I did with my hipster JavaScript-driven blog. I sent down a lot of JavaScript and resources for no benefit for the user. So does this architecture actually improve user experience? I don't know. I don't think so. But sometimes it's actually harming user experience. So when I used to travel, sometimes I receive messages like that. So and this is in German. So let's make it bigger. So I was in the Ukraine at the time and basically telling me, hey, Stefan, you just landed here in Kiev and you get six megabytes for two euros. This is already ridiculous but you have to use it in 24 hours. And now think that through for a moment. The average website today is two megs, but you have to use it in 24 hours. This is three navigations and I'm paying another two euros. This is where this entire argument is harming user experience. And depending where you are in this world, people are paying different amount of data for um, in their mobile contracts, right? So I'm in Germany, I have an unlimited something something contract, but that is not the case for everybody. And what you see here is a site that is called What Does My Site Cost? And I put in a, a URL, which is Spiegel, which is a news, a news site in Germany, and it will give you information on how much money loading this site would actually cost in different regions of this world. So now consider that. Uh, I was once in Canada and the people told me, well, phone contracts are really a bad thing in here. And they were intentionally checking out, hmm, is this site slow or not? So what we're doing over the last few years is that we ship more data for the same experience. And maybe app frameworks are for apps after all, right? I mean, Facebook is building Facebook with React. Are you dealing with that complexity? I'm not. And 
There are also examples out there where I do think it makes sense to ship a lot of things. So ignoring the um, privacy part, Google and stuff, but I like Gmail. I think Gmail is a solid service, good filters. I like using it. It's a good thing in my opinion. It is five megabytes of JavaScript. That's quite a hefty thing. But I'm fine okay, okay with that because I enjoy this experience. I'm happy to pay that. Fun fact about Gmail, Gmail also has a low data mode, which fits into 25K, which is this little button that you see in the top left, like save data or something. And I'm using that when I'm on the spotty train connection in Germany because I don't want to load that much JavaScript. So and it always feels like everybody is viewing, using React, Vue, and all these kind of things. But when you look under the hood, well, the majority of things is actually running on jQuery still. And maybe there's nothing wrong with that. And the communities around React and Vue are extremely vocal. And I always feel like, ah, oh, I should use and learn the latest and greatest. But maybe it's all right to not ship that much JavaScript to the users because there's a little benefit. So the web is not as cutting edge as it seems. And boring is beautiful from a front end perspective and fast. So when you're shipping a JavaScript framework, though, you have a few benefits going on here. So first of all, you have the benefits of client-side routing. And when you use client-side routing, you are allowed to re-implement an accessible navigation. So first of all, I hate when I see these kind of things, right? You navigate and you see a lot of spinners. I think that is somehow a broken experience. But also, when you go with client-side navigation, you are breaking assistive technology, like screen readers, because browsers do a pretty decent job of being accessible for technology out there. If you go client-side navigation, our friends at Gatsby here did a little bit of research, you have to include and fix the things that you just broke. So you have to implement skip links and you have pr uh, to provide an area live region to announce, hey, by the way, we changed the entire thing here. You just didn't notice. And I would love to see these kind of things on the web, right? This is what client-side navigation would be beautiful for. I'm I'm, I'm kind of browsing an e-commerce site. Everything is moving around. I have a delightful experience so that I smile and I think, wow, that, that is cool. And these kind of things are possible. So you see here an example from Sarah Drasna. Do you see these kind of things when you browse the web? I don't. We use client-side navigation to just replace the entire body all the time. Luckily, there's a, just FYI, there's a new proposal coming. It's called Document Transition. And this thing here will come to browsers, hopefully so that you can transition from one URL to the other with a little bit of whew, whew. And that is something that I would enjoy um, tremendously. So Ryan Florence, the maintainer of React Router, said once that there is a chance that he believes that client-side routing is usually not preferred. And this guy spent a lot of time building React Router. And also, when you go to the Vue.js documentation, you will see that they're not using client-side navigation. And I want to believe it is for that reason. So overall, I have the impression that we're using too much JavaScript. And there's movement. So as I said, and I, I want to, so I'm in the hipster JavaScript train. So what you see here is two frameworks that are going against this trend. So you see there um, Astro and Svelte. And they are not common built tools like crunching, minifying, transforming your data. They offer you the de developer experience that you have right now and then they strip away as much code as possible. So from the Astro um, documentation, the modern web seems to focus on an awful lot of JavaScript. We don't think it has to. So when you consider the things that we're building right now, you see on the left side the approach of shipping HTML to the browser. And for six months now, people started talking about multi-page apps, which I think is a poor term, to be honest. And then we sent all this JavaScript down and then it's transforming to a single page app. This is the moment when all the JavaScript kicks in, it takes over, and now you're running the best of both worlds, theoretically. And just to make sure, I really don't like that term multi-page app. So, but maybe this is the wrong approach. The people at Astro are aiming for something that's called an island architecture. Maybe it shouldn't be all or nothing. And maybe websites should look like that. Maybe the footer shouldn't include client-side JavaScript. And maybe this uh, thing on the top shouldn't include client-side JavaScript. This is currently not possible. We are always shipping all or nothing. And maybe we should go for something like opt-in, 
for JavaScript. Maybe JavaScript shouldn't be the default, but rather the enhancement. So in Astro, so this is all fancy fancy hipster stuff, right? So theoretically, you can use it with React, Vue, and Preact components. And here's this example from Jason Langstorff. He works for, for Netlify. He could reuse all his components, and Astro was just stripping away all this useless JavaScript because it was a content site. And look at 250k for a Next.js block to down to 10k. This is a direct impact on user experience. Also, the React teams are kind of looking into ways on how to make that better. So just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, server-side components shipped in Next.js. So if you're dealing with large bundles, you should definitely check that one out. And if you want to do some research, you can Google um, transitional app. This here is Rick Harris. He uh, maintains Svelte, who has, which has a similar approach of not shipping a lot of JavaScript while providing a lot of usability and functionality. So you can check that one out. He, um, he gives a lot of things. Should I stand somewhere? All right. So, but overall, I think there's a little bit of movement happening because I think that a lot of people agree that a great site should just work. And for that, I still think it is important to know the foundation of the internet. And this is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I would love to get away from, from wait, a great site doesn't have to be I have to send here, otherwise my clicker is not acting nice. So a great uh, site doesn't have to be built with React and Angular. And I feel like over the last few years, I was part of these kind of discussions. Hey, Stefan, I want to build a site. And maybe sometimes I gave the answer here too. Well, you should use framework ABC with server-side rendering. You have to have a service worker and an offline strategy because everything needs to be offline first, and then it has to run on the edge. Maybe it should be like everything. It depends. What do you want to do? A great site can be built with React, Vue, and Angular, but most of all, I think that a great site is accessible, fast, and secure. And I, as a front-end developer, I would really love to get rid of this. It's just HTML, right? Some angle brackets here and there. HTML defines over 100 elements. The HTML input element has 22 types. There are still additions happening, right? So you see here, enter key hint which you can use to change the submit button and forms. Chris Coyer, who's maintaining CSS tricks, wrote a 4,000 word article on links versus buttons. And at the same time, we see these kind of HTML, this kind of HTML shipping all over the place. The person meant well, doesn't make it good HTML though. If you want to see and learn a little bit on how to write solid HTML, you can go to hmlhell.dev. Um, so there are, are plenty examples of how you shouldn't write your HTML. So overall, I think that HTML is not easy. And HTML has a direct impact on accessibility. So when you look at the WebAIM million survey, WebAIM stands for Web Accessibility, Accessibility in Mind, and they're scanning the internet uh, once a year. So you see that 80% of the sites ship with low contrast errors. And everything after that is based on not great HTML. Missing alt text, missing form labels, missing links, empty buttons, all these kind of things that are so easy. And when you have a look at the state of framework usage here, you see that a standard React page is still shipping with 50 detectable errors by default currently. And you see a little green tick there. Um, and I think it's just getting better because React, Create React App is shipping now with this tooling. And I think this is a good first step to improve the quality to come with default linters here. Overall, WebAIM, this organization, once a year scans the in internet and they found that 98, roughly 98% of the websites out there have detectable issues. And this is not great for accessibility in the first place. But in the same time, every now and then, we get to see these kind of messages here, right? Something was hacked. Some third party was taken over because someone was nice on NPM and took over a package and these kind of things. And this happens while we have a security mechanism for that. So what you see here is a content security policy header that I ship in my site. And basically, what you can do with this is you can really define in your website, well, this is where the resources should be loaded from. If someone is hacking NPM and is starting to mine cryptocurrency here in your website, it will just fail 
because you didn't allow it. But when you go back again, here's statistic hat putting on, you see that only 11% of the sites out there are using CSP. While we ship a whole lot of third-party JavaScript. And at the same time, um, the, we ship 60% of the things that we ship include vulnerable and outdated JavaScript, because everything is just one NPM install away. So overall, I feel like the web lost quality. But at least, well, I'm a front-end developer, but at least front-end developers got more productive. And everything happened in the last 10 years when Node and NPM appeared. And now we're at the stage, it started all with Heroku, and now we have Netlify and Vercel, and in the last few years, serverless functions appeared. And this is pretty cool for me as a front-end developer, because all I need to do to create an API endpoint and set some uh, automation is a few lines of JavaScript. And with this, the options are limitless to build cool stuff for the web. So I can now build my own JavaScript applications or pure vanilla JavaScript implementation, and I, I have a software as a service vendor for everything out there. It was never that easy to build a product quickly, because we now have superpowers. But then the same time when I started doing web development in 2010, the Hello World was 10K and easily and quickly set up. In 2020 or 2021, the Hello World is 40K. And honestly, I might be okay with that, maybe. But then at the same time, the complexity just got out of the roof. Anyone ever dealt with a Webpack error right in, in, from the start? Good luck debugging that. And when I set up the side project, which was tinyhelpers.dev, was, there was not much stuff in there, and uh, people can go there and add their own little tools. And I provided an NPM script for that. So all you had to do is git clone, npm install, and npm run, uh, helper run, add, or something. And the person did that, and they told me, I just added two helpers, but it is ridiculous and brutal that to do so, to add a JSON file, he had to download 700 megabytes of Node.js shizzle. And I think the person's right. So when we consider this website from Italy, I bet you the person here uses some weird text editor and is FTPing stuff up. No question. For my side, as I had it at the time, I need a text editor, I need Node.js installed, I need NPM installed, I need to have framework knowledge. Ever onboarded a new person into your project? Well, that takes all the time. Uh, that takes a lot of time. So Josh Como, who is uh, known for writing CSS tutorials, he once said that he's building for the web now for 15 years, and it has never been so easy to build complex apps. I agree. But how many apps and things that we build need to be complex apps? I don't think that it should be that many. And where are we going with this trend? This is where I started with my internship. People entering the industry now go with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, some framework, some bundler, some hosting. And this list is far away from being complete. It feels like complexity rocks in the JavaScript ex ecosystem. But I'm not sure what we're doing that for. And sometimes when I set things up, I just feel like, what is all going on, Stefan? You're putting so many things into this thing that spits out HTML and renders some images. Is that the right approach? Probably not. So when I built the site Tiny Helpers, it w I ended up using, not using Preact. But the Preact maintainer, um, Jason Miller, he, we had a little bit of back and forth, and he said, well, ideally, Stefan, our tooling in the front-end world will eventually figure out, depending on the functionality that you have, to transpile or compile or whatever you want to call it, a JavaScript app or not. So ideally, we reached that point that smart people, people that are way smarter than I am, make these decisions and say, now it's time to go all in JavaScript. But in the meantime, I dropped Preact for this project, and I just added a few lines of handwritten JavaScript because all I needed was a hamburger menu. And that just works fine. So maybe, eventually, we will have good enough tooling and abstractions, but today I still believe that we have to know the web fundamentals to create a great user experience. 
And with that, we also have to consider that in our companies where we're working, with the technology choices that we are making today, we are shaping tomorrow's job market. Yesterday, I read something like, um, everybody uses React because everybody uses React because everybody uses React. It's just like, right now, this is the case. And honestly, I would love to believe that my job as a web developer is to build beautiful UIs and experiences. I think that's not the case anymore, though. I think my job as a developer is to decide what tools to use, to decide what frameworks to use, to do, decide what to prioritize, to find a good way to maintain this entire thing. It is not about building cool stuff anymore, unfortunately. Chris Coyer once shared that, and I think that is also in point. He chatted with someone who's been working at the company as a front-end developer for th three years, and their friend asked them to build a website. They had to decline. They didn't know how. This is because we ship and we build with so much complexity. And this list is far away from being complete. So when we look at the front-end landscape right now, it seems to be that there's a big divide in front-end developers. So we have on the left side, we have these JavaScript driven front-end developers that deal with GraphQL and React and style components and all these kind of things. And then we have the developers on the right side that care about UX, CSS architecture, and building beautiful, good things. Overall, I feel like it's time to just drop the term of front-end developers. Because there's so much, sto so much stuff going on right now. But unfortunately, and that's one of my last points, I feel like that developers right now put their job satisfaction over the needs of our users and customers. I want to use the latest and greatest, right? I want to use React, I want to feel cool, I, feel like I want to feel like a good engineer. But let me tell you a secret. Your users absolutely don't care about what you're doing there. So I think the main point is that we should value user experience over developer experience. But I think in the front-end world, what happened is that we value developer experience over user experience. So to close the whole thing, I love shiny tools and I love writing JavaScript. But maybe, just maybe, it is time to take a step back and consider the right tools for the job. So this led me to this journey. I was using a cutting edge JavaScript framework for three years. I went on a pure approach, um, 2020 going plus. I reduced the page weight by 64%. I reduced the build time by four minutes, going down to 40 seconds. I don't have a JavaScript pipeline. Oh, you know how refreshing that is to not deal with all that complexity? And if I need JavaScript, I put in um, custom elements that come from GitHub or somewhere else. So I love that. So Alex Russell once said that he's part of the anti-JavaScript JavaScript club. And I think I'm part of that club now too. And after rebuilding the entire site, I have an entire green lighthouse score because I didn't anything that makes it slow. And I have a site with a better user experience. So is a JavaScript stack driven, JavaScript driven stack really that bad? First of all, use whatever makes you happy. Okay. Even though I'm ranting here a little bit of JavaScript, use whatever you want. But consider that I had a talk with Kevlin Henney today, and he's basically known for uh, off broken screens or something. And we had a discussion around uh, technology trade-offs. I think it's important that you just to recognize, don't choose technology because it's hip or cool, and consider the trade-offs that come with certain technology choices. So maybe we should just focus on building sites that just work. And maybe we should worry less about the technology that is actually power powering them. If you want to have a look at these slides, they're available at my links online. And I own that domain and I have to tell that to everybody. And I'm Stefan and uh, thank you everybody for your attention. <laughs>